And finally, it's a pleasure to introduce our special guest, the Ambassador Mr. Sichan Sif. Sichan Sif is a former Deputy Assistant to President George H. W. Bush and U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. He is the best-selling author of Golden Bones, an American Dream Story, and the poetry book Golden Words. He survived Pol Pot's killing fields in Cambodia in 1976, which resulted in 2 million deaths, nearly one-third of Cambodia's population. He was separated by his, from his family by the Khmer Rouge. After a year in slave labor camps, Sitan Sif escaped to Thailand. Some following a, a few months in a Thai jail, in a Buddhist temple, and a, in a refugee camp, Sitan Sif arrived in Connecticut with two dollars in his pocket. In America, he picked apples, washed dishes, cooked hamburgers, and drove a taxi in New York. He earned, he earned a degree in international affairs at Columbia. And he ends up working at the White House, and then at United Nations. Others have graduated from Columbia's prestigious business school, but few have done so after arriving in the States with only two dollars, a scarf from their mother, and an empty sack for rice as their total life possessions. Welcome, Ambassador. You've got 20 minutes for your speech, and after that, we'll have five minutes for questions. Madam Secretary General, for the kind introduction. Mr. Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my wife and I are delighted to be with you today. I want you to uh, know that uh, in uh, the United States there is an old saying that behind a good Cambodian there is a great Texan, and this is my wife. What we are going to do for the next few minutes, we are going to take a trip back in time and in space, in time to about 50 years in the past, in space about 10,000 kilometers from here to Cambodia, where I was born at the end of, uh, at the, a few years after the end of World War II. When we go to Cambodia, this is where we landed. This is my village. It was, it's only about one kilometer from the terminal. So I was born in that small village, and I grew up with a very happy family until my father passed away in 1957 when I was nine years old. And my mother worked very hard to bring me up. She sent me to the best school. When I was young, my mother told me, no matter what happens, never give up hope. And that was instilled in me since I was in my childhood. Hope kept me alive when in the most difficult circumstances. Hope brought me to the United States. Hope sent me to the White House, and hope made me a U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. I spent a lot of time in libraries, uh, in the National Library of Cambodia, the inscription in French and in Khmer read, La fuerza ta po en tiempo, las ideas and that is the epigraph of my memoir, Golden Bones, Huesos de Oro. We will have them available at the end. In 1969, I became a flight attendant, assistente de vuelo of the National Airlines of Cambodia. I flew all over Asia, and I went to China. What I saw in China was unbelievable. I did not know that a few years later, that revolution would reach my homeland. In 1975, the United States was getting out of Cambodia. On April 10, 1975, President Ford gave us an address to the session of Congress. He said, for this administration, the options on South Vietnam and Cambodia are very few, and the time is very short. When I heard that, I said, the end is coming soon. Two days later, in fact, five days later, the U.S. Embassy was closing. I was told to be at the embassy within one hour if I want to be airlifted out of Cambodia. But I missed the helicopter evacuation because I had to meet with the governor of a province trying to help some 3,000 refugees 
stranded in that province. On April 17, the Khmer Rouge came and they turned Cambodia upside down. You heard about the killing fields, Los Campos de la Muerte. They kill anybody who wore glasses because that is a sign of being educated. They kill the businessmen, the teachers, the nurses, the soldiers, government officials. So my mother told me to run. She gave me her wedding ring, a scarf that looks like this. This is a Cambodian scarf. It's a multi-purpose scarf and a bag of rice. So I rode a bicycle for three weeks. For three weeks, I was on a bicycle trying to get across Cambodia. I used fake passes and false excuses to through, get through the Khmer checkpoints. They captured me and at the Thai border. They tied my arms behind my back, and they went to kill me because they suspected that I was trying to cross to Thailand. I was saved by a truck driver. He told the Khmer Rouge that I was an innocent person. For the next year, I spent 18 hours a day working in forced labor camp. We were given one bowl of rancid soup. At night, when I went to sleep, I never knew I would be alive the following morning. When I woke up, I said I would make it to freedom. On February 13, 1976, I was alone at the back of timber truck, so I jumped on the truck. I went through the jungle for three days, having nothing to eat or to drink. I fell in a booby trap. I was severely wounded, but I got to Thailand, completely exhausted. In Thailand, I was jailed. That's how I look when I arrived in Thailand, completely malnourished. I was sent to a refugee camp. There were some 3,000 refugees living in the, an area the size of a soccer field. They suffered severe mental depression because they sat around all day feeling sorry about the past and worrying about the future. I thought I would organize something to help them out, so I organized English classes. It was a win-win proposal because many of them were going to an English-speaking country like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the UK, the United States. At the same time, they were able to take their minds off the sorrows and the worries. On June 4th, 1976, I arrived in America with my mother's scarf, an empty rice bag, and two dollars. I wanted to adapt myself to America so that America would adopt me, to adapt, to be adopted. I picked apples in Connecticut. I drove a taxi in New York. Then I got a scholarship to go to Columbia. I worked on Wall Street and a few other things. And then I went to the White House. This is uh, me as a taxi driver. <laughs> but I was a safe driver. So in, we met the Reagans in the 80s. And then I was invited to the White House on July 13, 1988. That was the first time I met both the president and vice president. See the vice president Bush is on the left. Little did I know that I was going to work at the White House a few months later. When Bush got elected, he asked me to work for him at the White House as a deputy assistant to the president for the public liaison. That's my office. This is the Oval Office. And we were invited to a few functions at the White House. In 1992, after two years of negotiation in Paris, we came up with a comprehensive settlement for Cambodia. I was asked to go to Cambodia with a U.S. delegation. That was the first time I saw Cambodia since I escaped in 1976, 16 years apart. I did not recognize anything. It was an emotional return. The villagers knew that I had survived the killing fields that I was working for the President of the United States, they told me that they are truly a person of golden bones. Because in Cambodia, they call somebody who is very blessed, very lucky, a person of golden bones. Hence, we use that as a title of the memoir. In 2001, George W. Bush, 
appointed me as an ambassador to the UN. I'm going to pause here a moment and explain to you a little bit how do you work as an ambassador to your country. For me, it's a very particular situation because I wasn't born in the United States. I went there as a refugee. But America is a very big country. It's a land of opportunity. It was possible for me to come to Cam to, from Cambodia, going from picking apples to the White House in 13 years. That, should I just drop something? Nothing serious. For me, it's a very special uh, feeling when I walk through the United Nations every day. <coughs> My colleagues from 191 countries looked at me. Through me, they saw America. They saw its greatness, its future, its strength. They wanted to hear what I had to say. When I said on behalf of the president, the people, and the government of the United States, that was my proudest moment. And I was able to connect to my Asian colleagues because the Asian ambassadors, they thought that I was born in Asia, so they took me as part of their group. And the Asian, they like to sing karaoke. So when they had a reception, they had karaoke reception. So I borrowed them, I organized my karaoke reception too, because these are human beings. They may be diplomats, they may have di we, may, we may have disagreements on a lot of issues, but we are human beings. So I want to draw them out as real human beings. I speak French, so I connect quite a bit to the French-speaking uh, African ambassadors. I speak Spanish, so I connect very well to the Latin American ambassadors. And of course, I speak some English. And that is very useful. You know there are six languages at the UN, right? Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Russian, and what is the last one? Espanol, of course, yes. <laughs> but I would put Espanol before Chinese and Russian. So it's a very special place for those who are interested in multilateral diplomacy. And I trust that many of you would choose a career in public service. And if you decide to go into diplomacy, I encourage you to have at least one multilateral post, either New York or Geneva or Rome or Vienna or Madrid, World Tourism Organization in Madrid, or Paris, UNESCO, WHO, I saw you listed there, it's in Geneva. Because multilateral diplomacy, you had to deal with a hundred of delegations, hundreds. In bilateral posts, you only deal with one country. If you're ambassador to United States, the well, United States is a little bit different because <laughs> there are different departments, but you are ambassador to France, you deal only with the foreign ministry. At the United Nations, you deal with a lot. In 2001, the most critical event was September 11. That changed everything. Remember when the Cold War ended in 1989, I was at the White House. It was quite overwhelming for me as a former refugee from Cambodia who ran across the jungle 13 years later, there, and then I was sitting at the White House seeing history taking shape in front of my eyes. The end of the Cold War made the end of a very important period of our history. During the Cold War, you knew where your enemy was. There was a group of about 40 countries that opposed the democratic nations all the time. It doesn't matter what you say. If you said that Mother Teresa is the same, they said no. They just do that to oppose you. After 9-11, the world changed. The enemies are invisible, and they don't have a country. They don't have a government. I'm sorry what happened to, in March 11 uh, in, in Madrid and also in London, but we are joined to fight this 
enemy together. <coughs> that is terrorism. So if you go to New York, you have to build coalitions around issues. You have a co coalition on terrorism, one on HIV AIDS, one on food, one on women, and so on and so forth. I know you work on million development goals. This is very important. This is a very important issue because there are a lot of hunger, a lot of poverty, health, especially for children. We want to end all of this. George W. Bush, in 2003, he came up with the idea of a Millennium Challenge account. $15 billion. This is the money that was going to be given to countries that made three commitments. Self-governance, I mean good governance, transparency, investment in health and education, and in women and children. So it's already in the some of the eight MDGs that you're working on. But it's important to carry on because this is a journey, this is a mission. It takes a long time to end hunger, to end poverty, to bring equality in health. In my country of birth, for example, you are lucky, Cambodians are lucky if they make $100 a month. If they make $100 a month, they are very lucky. Teachers have to have more than two jobs because they make less money than a bus driver. When you go to Phnom Penh, you see all these luxury hotels, but when you travel outside of Phnom Penh, 10, 20, 30 kilometers, you see a lot of poverty. That's why it doesn't stop right here. And you cannot tell, I cannot tell whether we are able to meet the goals or not, because in September, the United Nations is going to have a review conference. But it's up to them to decide. But it's important to remember, just as I said a few minutes ago, that we may disagree, but we should not be disagreeable. We should find a common ground, common interests to work to promote the goodness of humanity. I'll give you a few more slides and I will end. In 2004, I was asked to go to Cambodia to represent the United States at the coronation of the new king. The king father on the right-hand side, who just passed away a few months ago, decided to abdicate. And I was sent to Cambodia to be there in the throne hall. And that's how my book started, in the throne hall of the Royal Palace of Cambodia. 2005, that's another milestone. This is the 60th anniversary of the United Nations. Martha and I decided that this is our last General Assembly. So we uh, were privileged to meet His Majesty King Juan Carlos and the Queen because we were, the greeter, we were the official greeters at the reception, and we were able to meet with a lot of heads of state. That was the largest number of heads of state and heads of government who came to the 60th anniversary of the United Nations. You may not remember this, but the UN was created in San Francisco on June 25th, 1945. So every 10 years, there was a celebration 1945 was Harry Truman, who spoke on behalf of the United States. 1955, it was Eisenhower. 65, Johnson. 95, Bill Clinton. And 2005, it was me. To follow the footsteps of those historic figures was quite an overwhelming experience. But President Bush knew that I was living, growing through the United Nations system. When I was a child, I was vaccinated by UNICEF. When I was a refugee, the UNHCR, which is based in Geneva, took care of me. So my, my life was intertwined with, with, with the United Nations. That's why I'm very privileged to be with you today to share my experience and I encourage you to follow your passion. 
my words for you would be be well, be wise, be worthy, be flexible, and be able to adapt to difficult circumstances. Follow your passion. When you do well, don't forget to do good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Is there anything you would like to ask to the Ambassador? Um, you've always, you've always liked uh, helping people even when you were at the Cambodian killing fields. Uh, but did helping others uh, made it easier to stay there? I'm sorry, I w w can you repeat the question again, please? Yeah. You've always loved uh, helping people, even when you were at the killing fields in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. uh, but did helping others made it easier to stay there? I, uh if I understand the correct uh, question, Greg, you asked me, uh, I've been helping people all the time. One point that I, I want to make, and it's more detailed in the book, is that uh, the reason I missed the helicopter was because I had to meet with the governor of a province trying to transport medical supplies and food supplies to some refugees who had been stranded. And I decided to go there first because I thought I would be able to, to save the lives of those refugees and I would be able to escape uh, uh, with a clear conscience. Uh, you are right. Uh, uh, when you put yourself in a position to help, you, you, you really have great satisfaction. And that's why my mother told me from the beginning that uh, not just that you never give up hope, but when you do well, don't forget to do good. You have to be in a position to help someone <coughs> Without ever, without ever thinking that you would get anything back. Just like the truck driver who saved my life twice. I never met him before, but he just appeared from somewhere like a godsend, like an angel. He risked his own life to save mine. To save mine. So that's, that's a blessing. So make sure that you're able to do good when you do well. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador.